Well, how can there be any escape from this hard problem? Well, in 2006, Galen Strawson proposed a way out. And his proposal was called panpsychism. And panpsychism is not a new idea at all, but he was the first person to make it a live issue in current philosophy and neuroscience. Strawson pointed out that the hard problem could be dissolved, or apparently dissolved, if one assumes that matter involves consciousness, even electrons or atoms might have some level of consciousness or experience. And so uh, he proposed that a panpsychist view where electrons, atoms, uh, molecules, nerve cells have some degree of experience depending on their complexity. And therefore the emergence of consciousness in human brains is not a difference of kind, but a difference of degree from consciousness found in less organized and simpler systems. So he still regards himself as a materialist, but he just says he's widening the definition of matter to include consciousness. Well, it's very deb debatable whether materialism could possibly include panpsychism because traditionally it's been opposed to it. But let's not quarrel over the meaning of words. At, a, at any rate, what Strawson is proposing is very different from traditional materialism. And other panpsychist philosophers have followed his lead, uh, particularly Philip Goff, who wrote a book called Descartes' Error, arguing for panpsychism along similar lines to Galen Strawson. One of the important points that Strawson and Goff make is that not everything would be conscious. A chair, a car, a sock, a pile of sand, a pebble uh, would not be conscious on their criterion. Consciousness would apply only to self-organizing systems. I talked previously about holes being more than the level of the, uh, some of their parts and how nature is made up of self-organizing systems at many different levels, atoms, molecules, crystals, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, organisms, societies, ecosystems, solar systems, galaxies, and so on. That there are many levels, and uh, their point is that the consciousness or experience would be associated with these integrated levels, uh, but not just with random assemblies of things. It's a bit like the difference between a mixture and a compound in chemistry. If you have a compound, like uh, methane is a compound consisting of carbon and hydrogen, this is very different from a mixture of carbon and hydrogen, just jumbled up together, carbon powder mixed up with hydrogen gas. A compound has a wholeness that's more than the sum of the parts. And their idea is that panpsychism would apply to these self-organizing systems, which have a wholeness that's more than the sum of the parts. Well, panpsychism is not a new idea, and it has very, very old roots. It is arguably uh, very similar to, if not identical with, the kind of animism we find in shamanic societies, in hunter-gatherer societies, that we find in all religions, in uh, the sophisticated form of medieval philosophy. Uh, there was a, a Christian form of panpsychism or animism um, developed by St. Thomas Aquinas based on Aristotle's work and his theory of the soul, as I previously discussed. But very soon after Descartes produced his split between immaterial spirit and material unconscious matter, 17th century philosophers reacted against that. One of them was Spinoza, who put forward a panpsychist philosophy of nature. Baruch Spinoza was Jewish, lived in Amsterdam, worked as a lens grinder, and was a powerful and original thinker. And he argued that the whole of nature is the body of God, and God is the mind of nature. So nature or God are two ways of looking at the same reality, the same wholeness. And that all things within nature have a striving 
a conatus was the word he used, a striving to preserve their own being. So he endowed everything in nature with a kind of life of their own, of its own, um, and the whole of nature as having a kind of mind which was none other than God. It was a kind of pantheist view of God. Another 17th century philosopher, Gottfried Leibniz, a German, had the idea that every particle, ultimate particle of matter, which he called a monad, also had a mind. And each monad, each atom, each particle, reflected the whole universe from its point of view, which meant that every point of view was different. It's Think of it for yourself. I mean, I'm sitting here now. I'm seeing the whole universe from my point of view. You're seeing it from your point of view. Um, that these are different points of view and we can't both be in the same place at the same time. Um, so everything has a unique vision of the universe from its own point of view, but a whole of the universe has these monads of consciousness throughout it, each of them creating a network, together creating a network of points of view. In the 19th century, there were many panpsychist philosophers. One was Arthur Schopenhauer, the great German philosopher. Another was William James, the American psychologist. And there were many others as well. The most interesting and important of 20th century panpsychist philosophers was Alfred North Whitehead, who, as I've already discussed, uh, put forward the idea that nature is made of organisms, not machines. And he thought of these organisms as having their own experience. Each of them had experience of its own kind. And so he also thought that electrons and atoms and um, animals and plants would each have their own kind of experience. So his panpsychist philosophy um, fitted in with this organismic or holistic view of nature and was explicitly formulated in that context. But one thing that Whitehead did that took this whole debate further and takes it further than Galen Strawson or Philip Goff uh, in the current contemporary debates was his relation between the mental and the physical. His idea that they were related to each other uh, in a different way from the way that people usually assume. It's usually assumed that the conscious or the mental or the experiential is related to the physical, to the body, in space. So we talk about the inner life, the inner world, inner experience, as opposed to the outer world, um, as if the relationship between mind and body or mind and nature is one in space. But what Whitehead pointed out is that it makes much more sense to understand this in terms of time, that the mental pole and the physical pole are related in time. The mental pole is the future pole and the physical pole, the body, is the past pole. The reason he thought this was because in the 1920s, he was the first philosopher to understand quantum theory and its implications. Whitehead was first and foremost a mathematician. He wrote a book with Bertrand Russell called Principia Mathematica about the fundamental principles of mathematics. And he grasped much sooner than any other philosopher uh, that quantum theory was pointing to some completely new view of matter. Quantum theory sees material particles like electrons and atoms as waves, vibratory patterns of activity. And anything that's a wave takes time to wave in. You can't have a wave at an instant, either in space, uh, you can't have a wave at a point in space, you can't have it at an instant in time, because it takes time and space to wave in. And this is fundamentally the reason for the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. You can't define an electron or electron or any other particle in terms of a precise place and time because it's a wave and takes time to wave in. And because it takes time to wave in, then it has to have a past and a future pole. Um, there's a polarity in time. It's a process, not a thing. So what Whitehead showed is that quantum theory has got rid of the idea of solid enduring matter that's just stuff that endures, like the old Greek atomistic idea of atoms or the earlier view of atoms in science. 
Instead, um, it's a process in time. And he thought that this process in time must have far past and future poles, and that the mental pole is the future pole, which is concerned with possibilities. If you think about it, our own conscious life is largely concerned with possibilities, things we might do, we might choose to do, and deciding among these choices. A lot of our mental life is unconscious, all our habitual life is unconscious, but our conscious mental life is about choosing among possibilities. And possibilities are things that are not yet physical, they haven't yet happened. Something very similar occurs at the quantum level, according to the Schrodinger wave equation of quantum mechanics. Um, uh, the wave equation tells you all the possible things an electron could do in the future. When it interacts with something, a measuring apparatus or a molecule or uh, another electron or a proton, if it becomes part of an atom, then all these possibilities collapse down and you're left with one physical outcome. It's sometimes called the collapse of the wave function. The possibilities collapse and it's now a definite fact, but it's in the past. And the same goes for us. Our minds are concerned with a whole realm of possibilities, but whenever we decide to do something, for example, I decide to lift my arm up, which I'll now do, this is a physical, measurable fact. But before I do it, it's a possibility, and I choose to do it at a particular time, um, and that possibility is then realized. But the minute it's realized, the minute it becomes a measurable, objective, physical fact, it's in the past, and new possibilities start opening up. So this idea of Whitehead, I think, gave a very original and potentially very fruitful way of thinking about the relation of mind and body. It doesn't deny anything about science. In fact, it takes further and, and gives a whole new understanding to uh, what is really the leading edge still of physics, namely quantum mechanics and its probabilistic uh, mathematics, which is always about possibilities in the future. Find out more on advire.life.